welcome to Nobody Told Me. I'm Laura Owens. And I'm Jan Black. And joining us on this episode is Nicole Lappin, best-selling author of the books Rich Bitch and Boss Bitch. Her latest book is called Becoming Superwoman, a 12-step plan to go from burnout to balance. Nicole is a longtime business and money reporter and anchor whose work you may have seen on CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, Bloomberg TV, and lots of other places. Elle Magazine said Nicole is singularly qualified to demystify money for the millennial set with a no-nonsense, chic style. She has a fascinating story, and Nicole, it's wonderful to welcome you to Nobody Told Me. Thank you so much, ladies. Wonderful to be here. Tell us more about your background and how you went from burnout to balance. Oh, wow. Well, I am the least likely person to be a money expert, that's for sure. I grew up in an immigrant family, so I'm first-generation American, never had the Wall Street Journal on the kitchen counter, never learned about stocks or bonds, maybe just bond girl. That was the extent of my knowledge. (laughs) And I was just offered a job as a business reporter, and at the time I needed a job. I grew up in a broken home, so I needed to start working super early on. And I just said yes, and I totally faked it till I made it. And then I spoke the language of money, not only for myself, but I spoke it to the world. And I had no idea that fast forward about a decade later, I would be teaching other women how to do the same thing. But I reached a lot of goals super early on. And as this often goes with a lot of women, once I got to a certain goal, I thought I would be happy. When I got to an anchor on CNN position, I thought I would be happy, and I wasn't happy. And I kept raising the bar, and my brain never got to the other side of balance or happiness until I had my second book launch. At first, I wanted one book. That wasn't enough. Then I wanted another book. And I had a complete mental, emotional, physical breakdown that stemmed from burnout and a lifetime of smoldering embers that finally caught fire and incinerated everything in their path, as I say, in my latest book, Becoming Superwoman. And that's when I knew that I needed to rethink how I worked and how I approached my self-care and how that related to my career. And what are the differences between burnout and depression and anxiety and what exactly you faced? So I think it's a gateway for some other more serious mental health issues, which of course is not in my skill set, it's above my pay grade. But for me, I was actually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I didn't even know that was a thing that folks who didn't go to war could get. I had a lot of childhood trauma that I never dealt with. Mm -hmm. And I had many bouts of depression, many rounds of ring, rounds in the ring with darkness, so to speak, and many times of hyperactivity and Um, you know, those were symptoms of PTSD, which I didn't know at the time. And so I don't wish I didn't have that. I am, you know, it made me who I am today. Those times made me work harder and it gave me the platform to write these books and to be speaking to right now. So it has been reframed as something that is not a problem, but I never expected to think of it as a superpower. Tell us more about what your breakdown was actually like, because you write about it in in detail in your book, and and it's it's really harrowing. Well, thank you. I, you know, wanted to be a hero. Um, I wanted to be superwoman for so many years, like a lot of young women who saved the world and looked really cute and sassy in those boots and perfectly clothed hair and... Superwoman, the character, is all things to all people. So she's ultimately nothing to herself. And that's what happened to me. I was completely neglected. I just self-prescribed for years, not drugs or alcohol, but work. And then I worked some more. And when I hit my own personal rock bottom, you know, I looked very put together on the outside, but inside I wasn't as put together as I looked. I wanted to be a superwoman with a face a woman who puts her oxygen mask on first before helping others. And they don't say that on the plane before takeoff, as you ladies know, just to waste time. It's totally true. You can't be of service to anyone else if you're crashing and burning yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you say that you don't want us to try to be super women, but rather try to be a super woman. What's the difference? Yeah, it's the space makes all the difference. So I don't want to be the character version, Mm -hmm. uh, the kind who 
you know, doesn't value herself at all. I actually did a social experiment that showed um, women listing the top five things they value most. And I had them write on a whiteboard those things. And they wrote amazing things like my job, my family, my husband, my dog, God, food, you know, whatever. And none of them wrote themselves on the list. And if you would have asked me a few years ago to do the same exercise, I wouldn't have thought to put myself on the list. I wouldn't have thought to put myself on the top five or 10 things I valued most. Would you? No. Wow. That's an interesting no, question. I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't either. Mm. Wow. Yeah, so I wanted that superwoman distinction with the space is a woman who puts herself on that list and is number one on that list, in fact. You dedicated your book in part to your former self who needed a hero, so that's what she became. What were the tools that helped you become a hero, and how can others find those tools in themselves? You know, for so long, I thought a guy was going to save me or a job was going to save me. And when I needed a hero most, I had to become my own. And I knew that that was going to be largely a solo journey. And I needed to get down with that on day one. So I literally put a ring on it myself. I um, put a wedding ring on my right hand. I bought it myself. And I had to really embrace the idea that the most important relationship is the one you have with yourself. And so I went on a whole journey. I'm not a shrink. I'm not a scientist. But my experience is my experience. And I took notes and I chronicled the whole thing. I didn't even think it would turn into a book. I just went on a mission to hack happiness and balance, not in a woo-woo way, but with brass tacks and tangible advice in the same way that my brain processed overwhelming information for how to break down personal finance or business as I did in my first two books. So many of the tools that I outline are simple but not easy. They're skills, um, and we can control our emotional intelligence and our emotional wellness. It's very difficult to change our IQ. It's within our power to change our EQ. We just need to know the tools and the tricks to do that. And it's, and you know what? Once you learn them, it, it's, it's a skill that you can practice like anything else. And in the chapter where you talk about putting a ring on it yourself, I, I loved that chapter, by the way. You talk about Thank how you. you carry your superwoman cheat sheets what should most women put on these and where do you suggest that we put them? <laughs> so I keep a journal with me everywhere I go. Um, I guess as a former journalist, I always love taking notes and it's like my Linus blanket. I can't go anywhere without it. So I put it in the back of my journal, how I'm awesome. <laughs> I remind myself of the ways when I forget because you know what ladies we have a mean girl inside our head mm -hmm. when I do something wrong at work or I say something wrong on the air I always beat myself up I'm like oh you're the worst you're the most stupid you're never gonna do anything right you're never gonna get ahead you're gonna die alone you're gonna be broken homeless and live in the gutter like if our girlfriend or best friend or daughter or mom or sister, if they did something that they felt was wrong, would we say that to them? No. We would say, baby, it's going to be okay. You're the best. You're awesome. And so I needed to figure out how to talk to myself like I would my best friend. So those cheat sheets are really helpful in times when it doesn't feel awesome. And so I see it in my own handwriting. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's me. I know that girl. She is pretty awesome. And it's so, you know, it's so basic but in times where you feel emotionally dysregulated and, or you're ruminating over something that might ha have happened, those are really helpful. Our Nobody Told Me conversation continues in just a minute after we tell you about a way you might be able to save money on life insurance. Look in the mirror. You look good. You're doing everything right for your health today. But if you're not planning for the what ifs of tomorrow, then it's time you do. The problem is, historically and rather ironically, People who are health conscious have overpaid and subsidized those who are less health conscious. It's not a conspiracy. It's just how life insurance works. Introducing Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates for people like you on their life insurance. If you're a runner or a cyclist or you're into CrossFit or another type of athlete, even a committed weekend warrior, 
If you're a vegetarian or vegan, then you deserve to be rewarded for your hard work with more affordable life insurance rates. And Health IQ can save you up to 41% because physically active people have significantly lower risks for heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And Health IQ is not just a lead generator. They take the customer through the entire process of applying, and the policy is underwritten by one of their top insurance partners. But these savings are exclusive to Health IQ. You won't find them anywhere else, and you must qualify to get a special rate. To see if you qualify, go to healthiq.com slash nobody told me to take the proprietary Health IQ quiz. Depending upon your score, as well as other related qualifying factors, you can save up to 41% on your life insurance premiums compared to other providers. Again, that's healthiq.com slash nobody told me to let them know we sent you and start the process with the Health IQ quiz. There's no commitment and you'll learn even more about potential opportunities to be rewarded for your commitment to healthy living. How do you think young women today differ from their mothers in terms of trying to have a balanced life or in terms of their goals and, and just life in general, the, the, the world that they're facing compared to that that their mothers faced when they were younger? You know, I think that we can have it all, but we can't do it all. And we often conflate that. And that's, you know, something that became more popularized in the last couple of decades, this idea of someone who has it all. And Helen Gurley Brown popularized this idea, but it's taken this whole other turn. In her book, she doesn't even talk about being a mother, but society has turned this into Superwoman, the character who is the perfect mom, who has a rockin' bod and is a CEO at work and (laughs) cooks a mean meal, all in equally measured parts. And that's just not realistic. I think oftentimes we compare ourselves to the best versions of all aspects of our lives. So we compare our fitness regime to a fitness superstar who works out five hours a day, or we compare our mom lives to a mommy blogger who homeschools her children and bakes bread for them. And that's just not realistic. We don't have the same set of circumstances as those women. And so I think we can have it all to answer the age old question, but only if we define what it all means and stop changing the definition on ourselves constantly. And do you think everybody's definition of it all is pretty much the same, especially amongst millennials? I don't. I think it actually looks different for everybody at different times in their lives. So if you look at a woman who is at her computer for 15 hours a day, you might think she's totally not balanced or she doesn't have it all. Well, I don't know. Maybe at that point in her life, that's what she's focusing on and that's what balance looks like to her. And in five years, it looks a little bit different. And so I don't wish in my 20s I had a more traditional view of balance. Uh, I wouldn't have the platform that I have today. And, you know, I think right now I try to forgive myself for the things I'm not focusing on. So I came up with a point system to break down balance because I hated this idea of work-life balance as a 50-50% breakdown mm-hmm. with Lady Justice and her two stupid bowls. I was like, this is so unrealistic. <laughs> you know, how are we going to have it in equal 50-50 parts? And I'm so confused. Is this work or is this life? I mean, talking to you ladies is fun, but it's also work. So right, right. <laughs> I totally. In, I have so many questions. And so I came up with a point system that's like the Weight Watcher system or the company formerly known as Weight Watchers, WW. And I say, give yourself 10 points for the day. List the top five things you're focusing on and the top five things you value and divvy that up. And the only requirement is that you give yourself at least one point for emotional wellness. Otherwise, it will require all 10 points like it did for me if it's too neglected. But for instance, right now, I'm focusing on my career. Um, I'm focusing on a book tour. I am focused on, on launching platforms around financial and business literacy. I am not focusing on dating right Uh now. And so when I beat myself up and say like, I'm not married, I'm 35, I have no kids. What am I doing with my life? I have to remind myself that I'm not focusing on that right now. And maybe tomorrow that could be different, or maybe in two years that could be different. 
But I think it's important to realize you can't do it all, especially not at the same time. Yeah, you know, somebody said that to me one time when I was younger and trying to wrestle with having a career and having uh, children and all those kinds of things. And they said to me, and I, I've always remembered this, they said, you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. And, you know, that really helped me. I think sometimes when you when you listen to the words of other people, like you're trying to get your experiences out there so that other people can relate to them, and, and it really helps. Well, thank you so much for saying that. You know, I felt like in this conversation, somebody had to go first. And <laughs> you know what they say? Like, I'll show you mine. Or if you show me yours. Yeah, right. right. Or, sure. Right. You don't even need to show me yours. Just show yourself yours as long as we open up this dialogue. And I think especially with the taboo subject, money is still I think one of the biggest taboos, fertility is a big taboo. I froze my eggs on Good Morning America. I was like, whatever, I'll just go for it. And, you know, I think mental health is a big taboo. And mm-hmm. so at this point in my life, um, the only way I know how to tell a story is to tell it really honestly. And I just think people know whether you try to hold back or you whitewash anything. So I was like, if I'm going to tell this story, I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, and I really relate to your story myself because I've been struggling with depression and with PTSD as well for years, and I find that I can go and be super, super productive for a certain amount of time, and then you face that burnout, and then you just want to sit in front of the TV for a little bit and not do anything. So you're putting like all 10 of those points into resting rather than you know trying to divvy them out into important things, and I'm wondering what advice you have for people like me and like you who are dealing with the same thing, what should they do when they start to approach that point where they feel like they're going towards an imminent burnout or breakdown? You know, I am not an expert in, well, anything. I think we're all still learning. So folks who claim they're an expert in happiness or balance, like run the other direction because we're all still learning. And I think the only thing I've really become an expert in is regaining my balance when I will inevitably lose it. So in those skills that I learned from emotional regulation to interpersonal effectiveness to mindfulness, those are the tools that I lean on when I know that I'm about to be slipping. And I think that I'm not only the writer of this book, but I'm a lifelong reader because after I finished writing and this book was going to print. I actually felt like I was on the verge of relapsing and on the verge of a burnout yet again. And I I was like, oh, God, this imposter syndrome that I thought I said goodbye to a long time ago Mm -hmm. has come back. And I feel like a total fraud. How am I going to go talk about balance when I feel like my life is hanging in it yet again? Mm -hmm. And then I stopped the production of the book and I went off the grid and I read my own book and I realized I got cocky. You know, I said, oh, I figured out this balance stuff. I went to Bali. (laughs) I met all the healers and I learned all the things. I'm good. I'll get to this balance stuff when my book tour is done, when the chaos is over. But the truth is there's always going to be chaos. It's life is a game of whack-a-mole when it comes to stress and chaos. And when one thing is over, you know, something else is waiting in the wings. And so I continue to try to remind myself that life has to be balanced and chaos, not balance or chaos. Mm -hmm. I think they have to coexist. And for me, um, you know, a lifetime of bad behaviors is what I was looking at. So only a lifetime of good behaviors would be enough to counteract that. And I think as women, we often use balance as a noun, like something we found and we're done. But I like to remind myself that it has to be used more as a verb. It's something that's constantly in motion. It's something you constantly have to work on. And I think we're all constantly, you know, fall risk so to speak. Um, That was a band on a hospital bracelet that I had when I left the psych ward. And it was at that moment that I realized self-care is the biggest asset or liability in our careers. When it's off, it can bring us to rock bottom. When it's on point, it can actually bring you more success. Because, you know, we have this equation wrong. We think we'll be happy when we get there. But actually, happiness brings us more success than money and not the other way around. Our Nobody Told Me interview continues in just a minute after we tell you about our sponsor, TrustAndWill.com, which features estate planning simplified. An estate plan outlines how you'd like to care 
for the things that are most important to you, like your kids, your pets, and your home. Have you been procrastinating about finishing your will? Thanks to TrustInWill.com, you can finish in just 10 minutes for all 50 states completely online. And they have people available to instantly answer any questions you might have. Laura and I are a mother-daughter duo. And as you can imagine, I want to protect her and the rest of my family in case something bad and unexpected happens to me. I couldn't believe how easy the TrustAndWill.com website is to navigate. It walks you through the whole process, helping you decide what's best for you at whatever stage of life you're in. Seriously, it's so easy. Do it for your family. Do it for your loved ones. Guardianships start at $39, wills at $69, and trusts at $399. Gain peace of mind by protecting your assets in your family. Take 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash nobody told me or entering promo code nobody told me at trustandwill.com. Again, take 10% off by going to trustandwill.com slash nobody told me or enter promo code nobody told me at trustandwill.com. And one of the things you advise in your book, Becoming Superwoman, a 12-step plan to go from burnout to balance, is to just say yes to saying no. Explain more about that. It's hard for women to say no in particular. I think because we come from a place of scarcity versus abundance. We think if we don't say yes to this interview or this job or this date or this party, we're never going to have another one. Uh But I like to try to reframe saying no to other people as saying yes to yourself. And Superwoman Shonda Rhimes says no is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What should you do if you feel too exhausted to see friends or to do after work activities? Is it okay to say no then? I think it's okay to say no Whenever you feel like you need me time, I try to come up with date night, whether it's with myself, with a friend, with a man, Um, you know, I think you can create your own definitions of that and you can create boundaries wherever you see fit. So maybe what works for me doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe at work, you're okay with doing your boss's kids, sixth grade science fair project. (laughs) Maybe (laughs) I'm not. (laughs) But so we don't have to have the same boundaries. We just need to know where ours are. Uh, tell us more about what you mean uh, with the step that you, you describe, step number six in your book, Hacking Productivity, Work Less, Do More. So I actually judged Miss America um, a few years ago. And the winner of Miss America, I thought, was not the prettiest or had the you know best evening gown or talent. She was the best at being productive in preparing for the competition. And so sometimes being done is better than being perfect. And also scheduling your time is more valuable than, you know, scheduling anything else because you can always get more money. You can't get more time. And if you break up your schedule in, I think, batching emails is something that's a thread between productive people instead of constantly refreshing it. I think you become way more productive. Uh, I like to start my day without looking at my phone because you fall into other people's agendas or other people's problems and you become a firefighter and you can spend the whole day and by four o'clock you're like, what did I actually accomplish? I was just like the email police. Right? We've all been there. And so I think having intentions for the day makes you much more productive. Um, Doing gratitude in the morning and evening, for me, I feel the difference when I do it and when I don't do it. So scheduling your time is, you know, I think something that productive people have nailed. They're not necessarily more talented or more skilled than everybody else. There's just wizards in figuring out how to break down a day. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that gratitude journaling because that's something that I practice myself, but I really like the prompts that you used in the book and was wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit about those. I thought they were great, and you say that for everything we're grateful for, we need to change it up a little bit every day and not say we're just grateful for the same things, even if we are grateful for the same things. Yeah, because otherwise we'll feel... If we write our daughter down every day, for instance, I'm sure you're grateful for your daughter or 
your mom or your doorman or right. whatever. <laughs> um, you know, but I think if you keep writing that the same day, you're not as motivated to stick to it. And actually, studies have shown that positive emotions are created if we're present for 10 to 15 seconds at a time. And I know that sounds like a short period of time, but think about whether or not you're truly present wherever you are. Are you really there for 15 seconds? And writing down actions helps us look for actions during the day. So if you say instead, I'm grateful for the hug that I gave my daughter before she went to school, or I'm grateful for that, um, you know, the phone call that I had with my mom where she told me about X, Y, Z, or if you're doing your doorman, I'm grateful for the hug my doorman gave me or whatever it is. Um, you know, having those specific moments makes your brain start searching for them throughout the day. And then it becomes a, a cycle of more gratitude. Mm -hmm. And what are those prompts that you like to use for yourself for your gratitude journal? So I took my gratitude journal and my productivity journal, I smushed them together and I created the superwoman journal. That's the companion journal, but I like to go through prompts. What am I grateful for today? And list three things and ideally those actions and then a motto for the day. And oftentimes I say, I'm a superwoman or, you know, whatever my motto for the day is, I'm a masterpiece and a work in progress at the t same time is a go-to one of mine. Um, th what would make today great um, and then at the end of the day, reflecting back and saying three things that made today great, how I could have done better. And then as it, as it relates to productivity, I like to remind myself of my goals and then connect the dots between what's on my to-do list and then what do I have as my goals. And really say procrastination isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's given a bad rap, but I think it can be a great thing if you strategically procrastinate things that won't advance you towards your goals instead of just indiscriminately crossing things off because it can feel so cathartic, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Having a check at the end of the day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. Great. I'm done with that. Yeah. I I'm wondering who you admire in terms of their ability to balance life, at least outwardly, or, or maybe someone you know, you know, inwardly, someone who's not a celebrity, who's, who's a figure in your life. You know, I have awesome girlfriends. I have nailed my girl squad. Um, it took me a while. I had to get some toxic barnacles off the, de mm -hmm. off the deck. Um, <laughs> But you know what? I have girlfriends who will listen to the same story that I tell them 50 times about an ex-boyfriend as if they were hearing it for the very first time. God bless them. And, you know, I think that having that community is what has been studied time and again as one of the contributors to happiness, along with gratitude, along with meditation and mindfulness and sleep and exercise. And so the community that I have has balance that of course fluctuates from day to day even or year to year, but having them as somebody who is going to give me the priority I give them is inspiring me to do the same. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what advice do you have for women who have maybe moved to a new city and they no longer have their tribe that they're used to and need to make new connections so they can be productive and happy in the future? So I have a whole section because I needed to make new friends as well. And I thought, gosh, I'm in my 30s. How do I make friends? And what I realized is that going to classes or things that I liked doing helped me find like-minded people. And so when I was in New York, I signed up for Course Horse, which is a site that helps you find latte art making or dream catcher making classes or all sorts of fun things that I found exciting. And so when I was there doing things that I loved, I found like-minded people. Um, there's been research that shows you need two out of three things to create sustainable relationships. So shared history, shared values, and equality. If you have somebody that you grew up with, um, just because you have that shared history, but you have nothing in common and they suck all of your time and brain juice, that is not a friend, mm -hmm. that is a freeloader. <laughs> so I, I think just keeping those rubrics and systems and processes in mind, my brain works a lot like that. So I try to keep that in mind, even though this is not necessarily an analytical process, having some framework has 
really helped me tackle it. You know, Nicole, our our show is called Nobody Told Me, and we always ask our guests, what is your nobody told me lesson? You've had so many experiences in life. What is it that nobody told you that you had to learn on your own that you kind of wish somebody had warned you about and that you'd maybe like to pass on to others? So when it comes to what we chatted about earlier, um, of going through bouts of depression, I was valedictorian of my high school and college. And I don't say that to be like, oh my gosh, look at me. I'm so awesome. I say that because when I was first given antidepressants, um, I was so shameful for even going into an office and then shameful for taking them. And I didn't know that not all antidepressants were created equal. I would then take my friends when I felt sad. That is so, so, so dangerous. Mm -hmm. But truly, I didn't know how to use it because I think people find it to be so taboo. And so I thought, oh, these are happy pills. I'm just going to take somebody else's when I'm not feeling great. Um, And I just wish I learned that before that. I wish somebody had told me um, that that's not how this works and that it's not something you can do in triage mode. It's something that you have to monitor and um, stay on top of. So I really wish somebody would have told me that. Yeah. And you know, it's so crazy because hopefully it's getting better, but I agree with you. I think that the world we're living in, certainly for women, it feels so taboo to bring up that you may be feeling depressed, that you do resort to things like taking your friend's pills, thinking you can take it once and you'll become happy and not realizing there are rules to it. So I I think that's great advice for women. Thank you. And how can people, how can people connect with you on social media? So you can find me at Nicole Lappin, wherever social media is served and Nicole Lappin.com. And I'd love to continue all the conversations. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Nicole. This has been a pleasure. Thank you so much, ladies. You are two super women for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Our thanks to Nicole Lappin, whose latest book is called Becoming Superwoman, a 12-step plan to go from burnout to balance. And again, her website is NicoleLappin.com. I'm Jan Black. And I'm Laura Owens. You're listening to Nobody Told Me. Thank you so much for joining us. 